So today, six, five, graphs of other trig functions. There's actually four more because there's tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. But we will be doing cosecant, secant, and tangent for now. The cotangent, you'll, you'll get back again next year when you go in and pre-calc. Um, and then today, if you have your graphing utility with you, I'll also show you what they look like on the, on the graph. So we start with cosecant. The most important thing here is that it's based off the sine graph. So remember, sine and cosecant are reciprocals of each other. The way you graph this is you actually graph it as though it's sine. So I change the equation to be sine. I graph it by doing the amplitude, the period, the key points, plot my curve. And that would be like if you were looking at this graph, the sine curve would be this one, right? This is just two periods of it. That would be my um, standard sine curve. Everywhere it crosses through the x-axis would be where sine is zero, right? And what happens if we flip zero? What's the reciprocal of zero? Undefined. And that's where the asymptotes come from. So everywhere there's a zero on sine, we draw these asymptotes. And then if we were to flip all the other values, it would create this parabola-shaped curve that bounces off all the max and minimums of my sine graph. The sine graph itself is not part of your answer, but it is what gets you the curve. So note that it's dashed, okay? So we're going to graph our sine curves. Everywhere it crosses through the x-axis, we're gonna draw an asymptote, and then we draw those parabolas that point up or down, depending on if it's a max or if it's a min. The beginning is exactly the same. You get your A, your amplitude, your B, your period, and your key points. And then if there's a phase shift, which we'll practice today, if there's a phase shift, you add them on. Secant is based off the cosine curve. Same exact process. You would draw it as though it's cosine. That's what this red curve would be. So that would be the parent function of cosine. This is two periods of it. Everywhere cosine is zero is going to be an asymptote. And then you would draw those parabola shapes bouncing off of your maximum and minimum values of your cosine curve. That's it. Now we're going to do it. Okay, so we're going to start by first changing this to be its reciprocal function. So what's the reciprocal of secant? Cosine. So we rewrite this as y equals 2 cosine 1 half x. Then we go through the same steps we've been doing. So what's the a here? Two. Amplitude is the absolute value of the a, so it would be two. What's B? A half. Good. So then the period is 2 pi over B, which is 2 pi over a half. And then we keep change flip that. And I get 4 pi. Sophia. I have a like, really quick question. Sure. Okay, so now I take that 4 pi and I multiply it times a fourth, a half, and three fourths to get my key points. So the first one is at zero. The next one would be four pi times a fourth. The next one would be four pi times a half. The next one would be four pi times three fourths. And the last one is four pi. So these cancel, I get pi, two pi, three pi. Then I go to my graph and I mark my key points. My amplitude is two. And my initial curve is cosine. So I'm gonna plot this as though it's cosine at the beginning. I start at the amplitude. I go down 
down, up, up, and I draw my curve. And notability, if you want to make it a dash line, you can. You do that however you want to do that. Now, if that was cosine, that's where we'd stop. Okay, but obviously we're going to keep going because it's not cosine, it's secant. So everywhere there is an, a zero here, we're going to draw an asymptote. And the rule on all of these is you need four asymptotes. So I need to extend these curves. For cosine, it's easiest just to like literally drop down on both sides and you end up with two more asymptotes. So cosine, it's easiest just to drop it down. It would be one pi away in each direction because that would be the interval in between those points. So now I've got my four asymptotes and then I draw the parabolas bouncing off the maximum points pointing up and bouncing off the minimum points pointing down. The initial cosine graph does not need to be part of your graph. This homework you'll see again just like it, what the last one is multiple choice, but you'll still do the work. You'll hand draw the graphs and then you'll select it on WebAssign. On WebAssign, you will not see those, the cosine curves. You'll only, and you won't even see the um, asymptotes like on your graphing utility, you won't even see the asymptotes. You'll just see those parabola curves. All right, if you've got your graphing utility with you, Take it out. All right, so we're going to graph it on the handheld device. You can also graph it on your app if you didn't have it. Like if this is obviously just to check your work, that's what this would be for. You're not going to have a graphing utility on anything that you would actually have to graph for an assessment. But two things. One is you have to be in radians because these are all in radians, right? Like that is one half X and we plug in those. These would all be radian angles. So you have to be in radians. You'll go to Y equals. I would do two, and then there's no secant button, so I have to do one divided by cosine. Actually, I need to put a multiplication in there, sorry. Times one divided by cosine. It automatically opens your parentheses, so this is where your B and your X is gonna go. So I could do one half B, or I could do 0.5 X, it doesn't matter there. And then if there was a vertical shift or anything after that, obviously I'd need to close those parentheses and then do the vertical shift after it. If not, you actually didn't even need that last parentheses. I hit enter and I hit graph. Now what you don't see on this graph is the key points, right? They're just tick marks. On a on your app, on your like a uh, free graph calculator app, you'll actually see the markings in radians. So if you want to see that, you can. You do not see the asymptotes. You do not see the initial cosine curve. All you see is the parabolas, which is the actual secant graph. You will not be tested on that. Obviously, that's just so that you can check your answers. All right. Now it says cosecant, which means we're going to initially graph what? We're going to change this to sine at the beginning. Y equals negative sine of X minus pi. What's your A? Negative 1. What's that negative doing? What's a negative cause on your graph flips it upside down so my amplitude is one because it's the absolute value of that what's the b well what's attached to x 
one. So then the period is two pi over one, which is two pi. That minus pi is causing a phase shift. So if I set that equal to zero, I get x equals pi. Positive pi is my phase shift. So these were not on your test, but they would be on your quiz when you come back. So I'm going to find my key points. I'm going to start with zero, and then I'm going to do two pi times a fourth, two pi times a half, two pi times three fourths, and the last one's two pi. Pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and two pi are the initial key points. Then to each one, I'm gonna add the phase shift, which is pi. So my first one is the phase shift, which makes sense. I have to give these a like denominator, so this would be two pi over two, so this is three pi over two. This is two pi. 5 pi over 2, 3 pi. So my first key point is not at 0 anymore. It's at pi. 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, 5 pi over 2, 3 pi. Amplitude is one. With me so far. Okay, so this is normally a sine curve. There's a lot going on here. If I plot just the sine curve, it would look like this. It's negative sign, so it's going to start here, come down first, up, up, down. So my sine curve, the initial function, looks like that. Everywhere there's a zero would get an asymptote, which means there's already three. I need four. So with sine, you could either go to the right or to the left. You could extend this in either direction. I could go back this way, and then my asymptote would be here. Actually, yeah, it'd be at zero because each key point would be a half pi. So not exactly kept to scale, but it would look like that. And then your parabolas would again bounce off the top or the bottom. You could have also continued this curve to the right. And you could have done your asymptote there and the parabola there. You need four asymptotes. Three curves for everything we're doing today. So all the reciprocal functions, both reciprocal functions, sorry, and tangent, which we'll get to in a second. Four asymptotes, three curves. Questions on that one? Like, how do I know that that's how far it is? Just because the distance between these two is a half, this is a half, that's a half. The, the distance in between those key points is a half pi. So I just went back a half and then back another half. Or you could have gone forward. All right, the third one is the tangent curve, okay? These are completely different. The process is completely different from what we do with sine, cosine, secant, and cosecant. 
the shape of them is completely different. If you look at this curve, okay, it does repeat like everything else. It doesn't end. But the initial function has asymptotes because if you think about it, tangent is undefined at the top of your unit circle and the bottom of your unit circle. So it would be undefined at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. But the shape of the curve looks like almost like a cubic function. Like it points up to the right and it goes down to the left. The period is only pi this time instead of 2 pi. So you get one complete curve in 1 pi. We're going to talk about how to find the asymptotes, the intercepts, and all those things. And how the A impacts our graph. Like all that we're going to talk about in a second. But just like with the other ones, you're going to graph four asymptotes and three curves. So for tangent, you would need four asymptotes and three curves. Same for secant and same for cosecant. This is our step-by-step -step for tan. So the first thing we're going to do, just like with sine and cosine, is find A. And it's no longer an amplitude. It is where our quarter point and three-quarter point is, which I'll show you how to graph that in a second. Then you find the period, which is pi over b instead of 2 pi over b. So that is different from sine. It is pi over b instead of 2 pi over b. Then we're going to set whatever's in the parentheses next to tangent, which is the bx minus c equal to negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And we get our middle two asymptotes. From the first one, we're going to subtract the period. From the second one, we're going to add the period. And that is our first and fourth asymptote. We're going to find the point halfway between, and that's the x-intercept, so that's where it's going to cross the axis. We're going to go a quarter of the way in and three quarters of the way in and plot A and negative A. And then we connect the points to make the tangent curve. So just like sine in the beginning, this is going to be weird. Okay, but it is the same steps on repeat. So if you practice this, it will get easier. All right, let's do it. This says the graph of 2 tan 4x. So first of all, it's tangent. This is different than the other ones. What's the a? 2. So at the quarter point, we're going to go up to, and at the quarter point, we're going to go down to, which I mean three quarter point. Sorry, other way around. At the quarter point, we're going down to. At the three quarter point, we're going up to. But I'll show you what that looks like on the graph. What's the B? Four. So the period is pi over B, which means it's pi over four. Some of the questions on WebAssign are literally just going to ask for the period of the function, and you'll type that in. And if you type PI, it's a shortcut for that pi symbol. Okay, then this is where it's different from sine and cosine. Now I'm going to take what's next to the tangent, and I'm going to set it equal to negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And solve for x. So I'm going to divide by 4 or multiply by a fourth. Divide by 4, multiply by a fourth. And I get x equals negative pi over 8. And x equals positive pi over 8. Those are my middle two asymptotes. When it asks for the asymptotes, you will write it as though they are equations because they are vertical lines. So you will write it exactly that way. x equals negative pi over 8 and x equals positive pi over 8. Ava. It won't always be symmetric. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Then from the one on the left, I'm going to subtract the period. And the period is pi over 4. And the one on the right, I'm going to add the period. Oh, sorry. That should be positive. I have to give them a like denominator. So pi over 4 becomes 2 pi over 8. And this is negative 3 pi over 8. That's my first asymptote. This becomes 2 pi over 8 again. And I get 3 pi over 8. And that's the fourth asymptote.
I am a visual person, so for me, it helps to literally split my space like that. Do the middle two in the middle. From the one on the left, I subtract. From the one on the right, I add. And now these four points are actually in the order they're going to go on my graph. So when I look at them, I see there are two negative and two positive. I need to make sure I give myself that amount of space on the graph. And then I mark them. So negative 3 pi over 8 is the first one. Negative pi over 8 is the second one. Equidistant on the other side, pi over 8 is the next one. And then 3 pi over 8 is the fourth one. And those are your asymptotes. You with me so far? Now I find the x-intercept, and the x-intercept is halfway between each of these. So halfway between negative 3 pi over 8 and negative pi over 8. Sometimes it's going to be obvious, like the one in the middle is zero. That's obvious. It's literally in between negative pi over 8 and positive pi over 8. If it's not obvious, then you're finding the middle of that. So I can do negative 3 pi over 8 plus negative pi over 8 and then take that answer and divide it by 2. So if I want to find the middle of those, this would be negative 4 pi over 8 times a half or divided by 2, which is pi, 2 pi over 8 or negative pi over 4. That's the point halfway between those two. So if it's not obvious, then you add them and divide by 2. Yep. I added, so that's down here. I did negative 3 pi over 8 plus negative pi over 8, which was negative 4 pi over 8. Dividing by 2 is the same thing as multiplying by a half. If you multiply by a half, then 2 goes into 4 twice. That's 2 pi over 8, which is pi over 4. And it was negative the whole time. I'm going to do it again on the other side if it helps. Halfway between negative pi over 8 and positive pi over 8. Again, kind of obvious, but if you wanted to find it, you could add them. Divide by 2, it's 0. Halfway between pi over 8 and 3 pi over 8. I would add, divide by 2. So this is 4 pi over 8 times a half. 2 goes into 4 twice. 2 pi over 8 becomes pi over 4. That's the point halfway between these. So those are your x-intercepts. The last thing I need to mark on my graph is the amplitude, or not the amplitude, the A. So in this case, our A was 2. So on my y-axis, I'm going to go up 2, and I'm going to go down 2, and I'm going to mark them. And a quarter the way in from left to right, I plot a point at the negative A. So about a quarter the way in, I don't need you to find that exact point. You'd be there all day. A quarter of the way in, I go negative 2. Three quarters of the way in, I go positive 2. And then repeat that process. A quarter of the way in, negative 2. Three quarters of the way in, positive 2. Quarter of the way in, negative 2. Three quarters of the way in, positive 2. And then I connect those points to make my tangent curve. Three, four asymptotes, three curves. All right, negative three, tangent one half x. happens with like it's not really a phase shift I mean it is a phase shift we don't treat it the same way you'll see what happens in a second 
All right, so we I added a C, that's a C in there, okay, which is gonna cause the shift, the phase shift, but you don't have to find it the same way we find it before because we use it with the asymptotes. So first of all, the A is negative three and that negative tells you what? It's gonna flip my graph upside down. So instead of going up to the right and down to the left, it's gonna flip so it goes up to the left, down to the right. So the order switch, I mean the curve actually flips upside down. But the A is still three and I need that, or it's not an amplitude, but the amplitude or the quarter point and three quarter point would be marked as three. That's what we use that three for. So actually the A is still negative three. I don't want to confuse you. The A is still negative three, but we use it to mark the quarter point and the three quarter point. The B is one half. So the period is two, pi over one half, not two pi, but pi over one half, which would be two pi. That's going to be the period. And this time, this whole thing is going to get set equal to negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So 1 half x plus pi would equal negative pi over 2. And 1 half x plus pi is going to equal positive pi over 2. These are going to be our middle two asymptotes. So I'm going to subtract pi. I get 1 half x equals, this would be 2 pi over 2, so negative 3 pi over 2. And then multiply by 2. x equals negative 3 pi. That's your second asymptote as you move from left to right. Same thing with the next one. Subtract pi. So subtract 2 pi over 2 and I get 1 half x equals negative pi over 2. Multiply by 2. x equals negative pi. Sophia? That's what you set tangent equal to in the beginning. Negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Always. So that you can get your asymptotes. All right, so those are the middle two. Then I want the first one, and for the first one, we subtract the period, which was 2 pi, and I get x equals negative 5 pi. That's my first one as I move from left to right. And the last one, I add the period, and I get x equals pi. So this time I got a bunch on the left. I got to make sure I give myself enough space. So I have negative pi, negative three pi, negative five pi, and positive pi. And those are where your asymptotes are. questions so far. Okay, then halfway between negative 5 pi and negative 3 pi would be what? Negative 4 pi. Sometimes it's a little bit easier. You don't actually have to add them, but if you did, negative 5 pi plus negative 3 pi is negative 8 pi divided by 2, negative 4 pi. Halfway between negative 3 pi and negative 1 pi, negative 2 pi. Halfway between negative pi and positive pi, 0. Then I mark my A, and the A is 3. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, negative 3. Now, normally with tangent, a quarter of the way in, we'd go to negative 3, and then three quarters of the way in, we'd go to positive 3, and my shape would look like this. That's if it was positive tangent, though, and this time it's negative tangent, so I'm going to reverse that. A quarter of the way in, I'm going to go up to, to positive 3. And three quarters of the way in, I'm going down to negative 3. A quarter of the way in, up. Three quarters of the way in, down. A quarter of the way in, up. Three quarters of the way in, down. So that's because it's negative tangent. 
it points up left and down right. Questions? All right, so the only thing that you didn't see examples of were vertical shifts on these. The vertical shift, you want to do the very last thing. So if you're doing a vertical shift, you do it last. So if I were to, so let's say I say tangent of x plus 2. Let's just say it's plus 2 at the end. This is my vertical shift. That's not part of what I said equal to the negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So my A would be 1. My B would be 1. The period would be pi over B, which would be pi. I would take just x and I would set it equal to negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, and those are going to be your middle asymptotes. From the one on the left, I would subtract the pi. To the one on the right, I would add the pi. So this would be 2 pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2. and positive three pi over two. So asymptote, 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 asymptote. I'd find the halfway point, the quarter point, the three-quarter point. A quarter of the way in, I'd go to negative one, three-quarters of the way in, positive one. Quarter of the way in, negative one, three-quarters of the way, positive one. I'd connect those points. And then at the very end, I shift everything up to. So I save the vertical shift till the very end. Okay, so I went back and grabbed example one just so we could talk about what would happen here if there was a vertical shift. Let's say that my equation said y equals 2 secant 1 half x minus 2 at the end. So now this is a vertical shift down two places. I would still go through the same exact steps initially. I would find my a and my amplitude. I would find the b and the period. I would find my key points. I would go and plot them on the graph even. I would draw the sine curve, right? Oh no, cosine curve. I would drop down the sides and I would find the asymptotes before I shift it. Once I shift this curve, it is harder to identify where the asymptotes would be because they're no longer going to be crossing through zero. 
So if there is a vertical shift, you're going to find the asymptotes before the shift up or down. So you're going to graph your curve. You're going to extend it to get your the extra four or the extra two asymptotes. You're going to draw your asymptotes. Then I would shift everything. In this case, I'm going to shift everything down to my curve looks like that. And then I would draw the parabolas. So when there is a vertical shift, whether it's tangent or it's secant or cosecant, you wait until after you graph the initial function, then you find your asymptotes, then you shift it. So the, the vertical shift should be the last thing you do. Chris. Isn't it You got it? Yeah. yeah. Like technically this would be my middle point now. And that's where it's, that's why it's hard to find where your asymptotes would go because they're shifted. That's why you want to find them before you shift. Mm -hmm. So again, I think, I don't remember how many questions I put on the, the homework, but these take some time. I'm going to give you time in class tomorrow to work on it. And then they won't be due until Wednesday morning. So like, let's say you don't finish them you're still going to have until Wednesday morning to do them. But obviously the goal would be to get some stuff done tomorrow while you're in class. Then on Wednesday, I'm going to leave an extra practice. That one has one of each kind that needs to be done in class. So there's one sine, one cosine, one secant, one cosecant, and one tangent. There's five graphs that needs to be done in class on Wednesday. Cause obviously that is something that you would need to be do, be able to do in one class period, especially if you're quizzed or test on it. Okay. So tomorrow you're working on the homework assignment for on WebAssign. You need to do all the stuff by hand. Don't lose points again if you did last time. You need to do every, all that stuff by hand and then select it because it's multiple choice. And then on Wednesday, it's just like a PDF with the five practice problems and that will be done in class.